Okay. Welcome everyone to the HCRI, the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute Landmark Lecture for 2022-23. Uh, I have to think about what year it is. Um, it's been a while since we've been able to do this lecture in person, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here. Uh, I'm Larissa Fast. I'm the director of HCRI, and um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Dr. Saba Bukhead, who has uh, organized this event and uh, will present our speaker. So welcome, everyone. Uh, glad you're here. And over to Saba. Hi, everyone. Um, I will, I'm very happy that we have today uh, Professor Maureen Fordham. So she's coming from UCL, from the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. She's Professor of Gender and Disaster Resilience and the Director of the Center for Gender and Disaster over there at UCL. So Professor Fordham has been researching disasters since 98. Uh, she's uh, 88, sorry. <laughs> She's an expert on gender and intersectionality in particular, and on community-based disaster risk reduction and vulnerability analysis. She focuses on inclusion and exclusion of uh, marginalized social groups in general, but more specifically on women and girls. And um, she's a founding member of the Gender and Disaster Network. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend you subscribe. They have a great uh, network over there. Uh, she's been a governmental advisor and uh, from local through national to the UN level. So we're really happy that she took the time to come and speak to us today. Um, in particular, these days, she's currently exploring the gender nurturing of these experiences of the city and the lack of gender responsiveness in post disaster reconstruction. And she's also looking at inclusion and leadership of women and marginalized in disaster risk reduction. Um, she's the PI of an incredible project, uh, which is gender responsive resilience and intersectionality in practice and uh, policy. So, great project. Probably going to speak about that a little bit. Um, and um, a partner of the Risk Pack project, integrating risk perception and action to enhance civil protection and citizen interaction. So, we're really happy to have you today, and I'm just going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Saba. So I think this mic is working and hopefully next next there will be some slides coming up. So thank you everyone for uh, coming and uh, we're nicely socially distanced here. Um, so it's also a healthy environment for us, I hope. Um, especially as I, I had COVID for the first time in July. Uh, so I <laughs> left with a, one of those irritating little coughs and therefore cup of tea to keep me going for the next hour. So um, here's my presentation, uh, gender and disaster, presence and absence in policy and practice. And um, yes, thank you for mentioning the Centre for Gender and Disaster and the Gender and Disaster Network. And there are links there and I'm I'm assuming you can get hold of this presentation afterwards um, and, and download it for yourself because um, I tend to have quite wordy presentations for two reasons. One is that um, if you're interested, you can take it away and look at it when you have a bit more time. Um, <laughs> echo across the room. And also because I, I don't speak with notes, so um, I have to look at a wordy slide to remind myself what I'm going to talk about and to stop me digressing everywhere. So uh, this was the objective of the talk that I was given. Um, so this is my this was my starting point. Um, why is it important to include a, include a gender lens to any disaster humanitarian project or research or activity? So not a small topic, um, uh, quite a challenge. And <coughs> this was a challenge for me, what to talk about that I haven't said before. So I thought, well, I never really talked much about this. This might start it off in an odd kind of way. 
So how did I kind of get into all of this? And I started out working on the sociology and, and philosophy of science and technology. So I'm in the right city for that, Manchester, science and technology, you missed, etc. cetera. Um, and I, I, I did some early training as an ecologist and, con in, and in conservation management. And I was, asked to do a piece of work by London Wildlife Trust, which was looking at the wildlife value, the conservation management of golf courses in London. I am not a golfer, I have to say, I personally have got no interest in golf as golf, but I became extremely interested in golf courses where I was doing botanical surveys, looking at what the wildlife there and also uh, interviewing greenkeepers about how they managed it um, because golf courses were under threat by lots of uh, uh, pesticides, um, other chemicals. Um, so that was the start, but of course, coming from a critical social science background, I couldn't stop there because I would hardly started when I found um, an interesting set of inequalities and discrimination emerging. I never knew that uh, on many golf courses um, that, that women were confined to like the, the ladies day uh, on a Thursday usually when nobody else wanted to play. Um, and then I found out, um, and, and there's context for this in London, um, when I was doing this, there were over a hundred golf courses in London, in the greater London area, uh, and I went to 45 of them, and uh, the, the Jews, Jewish people were, uh, were usually discriminated against and couldn't join golf clubs. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, <laughs> they have to go to their own golf club and then also then there's this gender discrimination happening. Um, so Jewish women were doubly impacted there in terms of uh, when and where they can play. And, and this double impact that opens up this whole intersectionality question. So although the title is very much focused around gender, when I say that, I'm thinking big. Um, and a lot of people, when you say gender, will think it's about women and women only or women mostly. And it's true that there is still a lot of uh, work to be done around um, women's inequality, but gender is bigger than that. So why did I start with that? Because if we look, we will find discrimination and inequality everywhere. And this is my answer to people who say, why do we need to look at gender in humanitarianism, in disasters, etc.? Because if it's there in the everyday, and you do still have to convince some people that it is, but if it's if there are if there is gender discrimination, gender inequality in the everyday. Why wouldn't it be there in disaster and humanitarian settings? So that's my starting point. So a lot of what I'm talking about is gender in this big sense, but also um, to place the exceptionalism of disasters, humanitarian crises, in their context, the root causes of the kinds of um, inequality, marginalization, exclusion that I see. And you can start with gender, but uh, you can expand beyond that. So that was my starting point. So we're talking broadly here across disaster, um, humanitarianism, and development issues. So there's this nexus where they should or could and often don't <coughs> come together. So they are connected, but they're often separated. And there are these 
very blurred professional, disciplinary, uh, disciplinary, philosophical, um, different worldviews, a whole mess of differences in there in terms of who works in which one of those and how many people work across them. And you'll find it encompasses so many different views, worldviews, political positions, um, that it's difficult to generalize, really, um, because it tends to get broken down into smaller and smaller pieces, which we'll talk about as we go through, because I think maybe a, one way in is to look at um, the disaster cycle. And just as an aside, um, on the slides, uh, every now and again, there are some <laughs> key references or, or you know, th things that you might look at um, along the side or along the bottom, but there's a bunch of them at the end for you. Um, and also some other examples of where you might go for more information if you're interested in this. <laughs> So uh, if you were to Google disaster cycle, uh, as I did, um, and these are the kind of images that come up. Um, they come up in you know, all sorts of shapes and sizes and with um, varying components. But we were, what we're really talking about here is the before, the during, and the after of disasters, to put it simply. Uh, and it's often represented in this way as this as this cycle. Um, and as I say at, at the start there, it's much disputed, often rejected. Lots and lots of papers discussing this or adding in different components or taking them out. Uh, you know, choose choose the one that you're happiest to go with if it serves your purposes. Um, but it's true that, um, uh, that it's used a lot in so-called natural disasters, but I want you to get that out of the way at the start. You know, my, my, my position and that of um, um, a number of my colleagues is there are no natural disasters. There might be natural hazards, but by the time it's become a disaster, people, their policies, their politics, their actions have become involved and have created uh, a disastrous situation, has put people in harm's way um, and often put particular subgroups of a population in more harm's way than others. Um, that's my starting position anyway. So a lot of my work is around the so-called natural disasters. So disasters with a natural hazard or an environmental uh, trigger particularly. So if you're looking at the disaster cycle, just to pick one um, uh, at, at random out of the Google selection, uh, these are the kinds of words that you will see. You'll see uh, preparedness, you'll see um, the, the big splash of uh, the disaster impact, uh, the response phase, the recovery, mitigation. Uh, you hardly ever see that word, except in, in this kind of environment, you know, how to mitigate disasters. So by mitigating them, you're often not stopping them. You're not preventing them from happening, but you're trying to limit the damage to people, to property, to things that are valued um, when they do occur. Uh, and I've found over time that you, you get certain uh, professions or practices or disciplines involved in the different stages. Um, mitigation and preparedness, you often have engineers of many kinds involved in mitigation. And uh, they might be river engineers, um, geomorphologists de dealing with, uh, with, with flooding issues, for example, uh, emergency planners or civil protection authorities. Um, 
during the response phase, who is doing that? You often have what, this, what we call the, the blue light services or emergency services, um, police, uh, fire, ambulance, the military, uh, humanitarians going into the field at crisis points. And, and then there's a recovery period. That's kind of the core relation, actually. Um, the recovery period, and it's had um, less interest um, over the years in this field because it tends to be handed off to others. So a lot of planners, like city planners, thinking of rebuild, building and reconstruction, um, uh, social care, providing housing and health uh, and other kinds of forms of social protection. And I, I thought, well, how, how do I describe um, <laughs> the, the kind of the gender, you know, the gender element here, the gender responsiveness? And I, I'd have to say that typically there's not a lot when you're in the engineering um, field, and then you've really got to make that join, you know, join the dots, make the connection. Why gender? Why do we need to think about it there? And uh, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of things I could say about all of these slides, um, and I'm trying not to digress too much. But hopefully, I'm leaving you with some possibilities for questions, or comments, or observations um, when I do stop talking. So we can save them up as we go along. If you want to uh, discuss gender responsiveness in engineering. I mean, I'll touch on it again a little bit later, but uh, emergency planners that used to be dominated by military and ex-military uh, and used to be almost, um, almost all male. Uh, when I first started doing this work uh, like a hundred years ago, um, I, you know, I, I would see a room full of uh, full of men, and particularly men in uniform. Um, and there wasn't a lot of diversity in emergency planning. It's, it's got a lot better now, but a long way to go still. In response, you, you, uh, it, it was also dominated by a very um, uh, masculinized um, approach, and, and by that I'm not just saying men, I'm talking about masculinity and norms of masculinity, being macho, being, being the big male, usually hero, rescuer, that role, um, and that is very common across response, um, and Again, it's another one where you've really got to fight to uh, to to raise awareness around uh, the, the the gender concerns that there might be there. But again, um, think up your questions or observations or challenges um, uh, around any of that. <coughs> uh, in the recovery period, um, that's often when the the, the blue light um, services uh, military and others have handed it off to um, local authorities, to municipalities, to, to those who do deal with the social, the social care. Uh, and then I, 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 I didn't give it all greens all the way across um, because just because it's dominated by women and women's work doesn't make it gender responsive necessarily just to, uh, it's the argument against the old kind of quota argument, just to put so many women compared to so many men in any situation does not necessarily make it gender responsive, gender uh, transformative. You have to have that uh, awareness and uh, the, the desire for change behind it as well. Same thing, planners, construction, um, the construction and reconstruction of, of cities, of communities at any scale after disasters um, 
has been sadly lacking in voice for uh, for women and many other social groups. Uh, I'll come back to that a bit. So if we looked at mitigation, for example, um, disaster early warning systems are a form of mitigation, uh, of non-structural mitigation. So you're setting up a system and you're trying to support people to, uh, to shelter, to escape, to evacuate from an uh, impending um, disaster. Uh, and I want to show you a very short film, hopefully, technology allowing. Um, it's just uh, under four minutes, but, um, and made by UN Women. Um, so um, meet Majura Parvin um, from Bangladesh, who is now a unit leader in the Cyclone Preparedness Programme. And um, you'll have to follow the subtitles um, um, because she's speaking in, in her own language. But um, she is, yeah, she's, she, she really makes the, the, the argument for warning systems in their social context. So let's give it a go. Um, yeah. Amanna Masura Parvin, the Garon number Padapukirunian, at number what Purbu Patakali. Amra Pazbon, Duibhai, Amar Pita Matane, Duyazar, Noishali Position, me, Ila Hisil. Ila Harpare, Zokon, Zolos Sashoisula, at Put Pani Bidhi Har Karone, Amade Beribat Gulu Shop Dinazai. আমাদের তিনটা ঘর ওই ঘরটা কিন্তু ভেসে গিয়েছিল দেখি যে এই সমান পানি একদম আমি নিজে ওই আইলার ভিতরে ওই পানির ভিতরে এই সমান পানিতে প্রথম কিন্তু আমার জীবনের দৃশ্য গরু বাসির বাসুর গবাদি পশু মানে যা কিছু ছিল সত্য মুড়ি পরিষ্কার কারণ ও তো হঠাৎ ওই যে আইলারটা হয়েছিল কিন্তু হঠাৎ তারপর ওখান থেকে শিক্ষা নিলাম যে আমাদের একটা কিছু করতে হবে তখন 2009 সালে সিপিপি গঠন হয়েছে সেখান থেকে আমাদের যে নারী শিক্ষা সেবক আমাদের রেড ক্রিস সেন্টারের মাধ্যমে আমাদের ট্রেনিং করান হতো আমি ফনি ঝড়ে কাজ করছি তারপর যখন বুলবুলি ঝড় হইছে সাইন নাম্বার সিগন্যালের পর পরই কিন্তু আসরা কেন্দ্র চলে যায় চলে যাওয়ার পরে ওখানে যাই দেখি যে আলোর ব্যবস্থা আছে কিনা পরিষ্কার পরিচ্ছন্ন আছে কিনা আমি নিজে আসরা কেন্দ্রে ঝাড়ু দিস আমরা এই টিম লিডাররা সমস্ত ঝড় কিন্তু অলরেডি চলতিছে প্রচন্ড পরিমাণে ঝড় চলতিছে আমরা এই ঝড়ের মাধ্যমে আমার আমার যে ইউনিয়ন টিম লিডার আমার টিম লিডার আমরা আমাদের সিপিপি এর যে শ্রেষ্ঠ সেবক আছে পরে ওখান থেকে বেরি আমরা কিন্তু মাইকিং মাইকিং শুরু করেছি সমস্ত বাড়ি 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 যেই যেই পুরুষ মানুষ ওরা তার বাড়ির ভিতরে যাইতে পারে না আমি ওরা রাস্তা দিয়ে দিয়ে মাইকিং করে আমি ওর ভিতর দিয়ে আমি বাড়ির ভিতরে ঢুকি পড়ি যেই বলি যে তোমরা আশ্রা কেন্দ্র ওঠো কারণ গর্ভবতী যারা যে গর্ভবতী থাকে ওদের জন্য তো ঝুঁকি বেশি গর্ভবতী বন্দি প্রতিবন্দী শিশু বৃদ্ধা বৃদ্ধ এদের জন্য তো বেশিরভাগ ঝুঁকি আমি ওদের নিজে আমি ওদেরকে আশ্রা কেন্দ্রে নিয়ে যাই প্রতিবন্দী আমি নিজে ঘাড়ে করে নিয়ে গিস নারীদের জন্য কিন্তু দুইটা দুর্যোগ যেমন আমফাম একটা দুর্যোগ আর তারপরে নারীদের জন্য আর একটা দুর্যোগ আছে ওখানে ওই পুরুষ পুরুষ নারী উভয় মিলে ওখানে বিশৃঙ্খলা ঘটে যে কারণে ওরা সাইক্লোন শেল্টারে যেতে চায় না কারণ নারীদের যে একটা আলাদা যে একটা পরিবেশ থাকবে নারীদের যে যেমন একটা দুগ্ধ দানকারী মা ওই যে পুরুষের সামনে সে তার বাচ্চা দুধ দিতে পারে না তা আমফান ঝড়ে আমান পুরুষ শ্রেষ্ঠ সেবক তুমি নারী তুমি আমাদের সাথে এসে প্রসারে তুমি থাকবা কেন তুমি যাও নারীদের ওইখানে যাও তো আমাদের সাথে তোমাদের তোমার থাকার দরকার নেই আমি বলেছি কি যে এ তুমি পুরুষ তুমি পারো আমি নারী আমি পারি না আমিও যেমন মানুষ তারাও তেমন মানুষ ফোরম তো একই দিচ্ছি তা আমি বাড়ির বাড়িতে যাব কেন আর তোমাদের সাথে আমি থাকতে পারবো না কেন খুব কষ্ট করে আমার এই স্থান অর্জন করতে হয়েছে মানুষ আমাকে বলে যে তোর ভয় বলতে তোর দিলে নেই আমার এই স্পৃহা দিকে কিন্তু প্রতি প্রত্যেকে আমার সহযোগিতা করে ট্রেনিং এর মাধ্যমে আমরা যে কাজ করছি এ দেখে ওদের আগ্রহটা আরো কিন্তু বেশি যাচ্ছে যে ওরাও তো নারী ওরা যখন করছে আমরাও পারবো না কেন ওদের সাথে সামিল হতে তাই এই জন্য তো ওরা এগিয়ে আসছে 
পুরুষ যেটা করতে পারে নারীরাও সেটা করতে পারে একা আমি নিজে দশজন পুরুষের কাজ আমি নিজে একা করি আম্মা সুরা And I'm sure she could do the work of 10 men, and I'm sure she does. Um, so I think she tells that story perfectly um, for the limiting ways we think about the roles of women and girls, um, and uh, maybe people with less education or uh, less power and influence, but look what she can do, and she's one of uh one of many actually um so another example would come uh in terms of response you know who does the response well uh we talked about the, the blue light services the military etc but um this example um from roots international and myra commission um this one in particular um the Garifuna in Honduras. So there they have a, a, a slave heritage um, and they are a, a marginalized group. <clears throat> but look what this kind of grassroots women organized um, responses came up with um, after Hurricane Mitch in 1998. So they were doing all of the, the responses, but it also merged into the other stages, the, the re reconstruction and recovery stages, um, and they were there and they were organized, they were self-organized. Uh, and we're talking about women subsistence farmers here. Um, and yet they've managed now with support from Wairo Commission and Fruits um, in in helping and supporting advocacy. And um, this is Anna Lucy, uh, Bengo Chair, speaking to the UN, for example, um, and bringing grassroots women's voices into the UN and the global platforms for disaster risk reduction. So, you know, what does this say about policy? Uh, you see that it uh, doesn't handle gender very well. Um, it also tells us that advocacy is necessary, um, but it's not always sufficient um, for transformative change. Um, and, and just to uh, underline the fact that, that anyone can actually get involved at influencing or trying to influence policy, even at that global level, by engaging with um, groups, networks, coalitions that um, already exist. So anyone in the room could do that. That's what I tell to my students. Um, and this is what we have advocated for a number of people, uh, people in the Gender and Disaster Network, but uh, joining with much bigger collectives to uh, make our voices much louder. Um, negotiating, in some cases, line by line, to try and introduce more uh, gender responsiveness into the policy level. Um, at that global level, it's really hard, because it tends to be very generic at that global level, because you've got to get um, consensus across uh, across member states, a sufficient number of member states um, to get it passed. But it's all in the implementation, you know, a bit further down the line, and that's where you can also uh, make your own impact, usually not when you're a person on your own, um, but joining together. So as part of a various coalitions, you know, um, a number of us have been involved over the years in trying to influence policy and trying to change the, the, the landscape out there. And um, these were a set of slides that we did for the, uh, the Gender and Disaster Network did for the Global Platform on Disaster Risk Reduction um, in Mexico in 2017, where we looked back across 
gender and disaster, well, disaster policy, and looked for the gender and the way it was used. Since the Gender and Disaster Network started in the 1990s, it started in 1997, so we just looked at it across three decades. And, and beginning then in the 1990s, you know, we got a lot of man-made this and man-made that. We got a lot of natural um, uh, and a lot of technical as well. Um, and then moving into the 2000s, we started to get a bit more, but um, it was very much focused around kind of um, genders, the gender sensitive, um, but that was mostly around, you know, women's participation. Um, but slowly, you know, things were beginning to change. Um, and um, gender-based violence in disasters, which now many people have become aware of because of COVID, when it was so widespread and it hit the headlines. But I can tell you, it's been there all along and look at any disaster and you will find gender-based violence in there. Uh, and then into the 2010s, um, uh, we'll have to update it and go into the 2020s. But um, here we're starting again to get um, uh, LGBTQI. So we're starting to get this introduced very uncomfortably for a lot of people. But, you know, there's enough people uh, pushing now to bring this in. Um, and also um, men and masculinities. So not just looking at women and gender equals women, but uh, trying to really unpack gender in that bigger sense. Uh, so the women's major groups, one of the UN major groups, um, the UN's attempt to organize all of these different kinds of um, collections of people who are advocating for particular causes, whether it's uh, for, for children or for the elderly or for trade unions or for indigenous peoples or all of these groups. So there are groupings and you can become involved with these um, and try and organize and push uh, the negotiations at the policy levels. So uh, the big one for us working in um, uh, disasters with a natural hazard trigger, not only that, but around that, is the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. How many of you have come across the Sendai Framework? How many in the room? A few of you, yeah, quite a few, good. Um, so that's, you know, this big global level, but it's the global level framework for which um, lower levels of administration uh, find their way through, you know, what, what's, what are the priority agendas? Uh, usually because they think there's, there's money and budgeting that's going to follow these. So, um, and it has seven targets, it has four priorities for action. And at that upper level, yeah, there's, there's some more gender, but uh, not a lot. Um, I mean, for example, you know, take a look uh, uh, the picture on the right. Uh, anyone want to make a comment about, you know, when I say what's wrong with this picture? Anyone? <coughs> what well, spot the women to start? Um, so here is, you know, the man's world of disasters, um, and. I think there's one woman there. Um, yeah, what's wrong with this picture? So, and that was 2018. So, uh, <laughs> Zara Zaidi and I um, did a did a paper, uh, the missing half of the Sendai framework, where we were critiquing it. Um, and we were bringing up the things that we think should be in it and are. So in order to create a truly gender responsive disaster risk reduction system, the themes of equity and justice 
must also be central, and, and they're not. Um, it must advance the human rights of women. Rights, that is a very tricky word in the, in the UN context and endless arguments about using that in any framework. Uh, encourage the collection, analysis and use of disaggregated data. How do we know there's a problem uh, for women or for uh, people of different ages or people of different uh, sexual orientation, uh, gender minorities, um, indigenous people? How do we know that if we don't disaggregate the data, collect that disaggregated data? Um, promote capacity building and integration of women's leadership. So not just including women and thinking about women because they're so vulnerable, but considering women's leadership. And you know, think about um, Monsieur Parvin, when you think about women's leadership, what a, you know, a natural leader she is. Um, address the redistribution of unpaid domestic and care work. What's that got to do with disasters and humanitarianism? Well, maybe some of you might like to uh, make an observation about that or ask a question about that um, shortly. Uh, advocate for social safety nets and investment in women and girls, health and well-being and resilience. You know, and that was just the start of it, really. Um, so there is a big agenda out there. Um, <clears throat> But we do have these massive policy problems. And one of the major problems we're facing now is boredom um, with gender. So if anyone's gone to sleep already, <laughs> um, I get it. I, I, get, I really do get it. It's because gender has been mainstreamed so often. It's mentioned all the time. It's in all the checklists not all the checklists, it's mentioned in a lot of checklists. Yes, it's there, but what does it really mean? Um, I, you know, I, I tend to say it's everywhere and nowhere. So a, a bunch of us in the, the GRIP project, I'll mention that later, but I don't have time to talk about it a lot, but um, we did a blog, so it's on the, on the GRIP website, um, gender in disaster risk reduction, mainstreamed, into invisibility and that's because some of us decided we wouldn't go to the global platform um, because we couldn't really see that we were going to make a difference so we wrote something instead so gender mainstreaming we see it everywhere but what are the outcomes where is the impact where is the transformative change that we're looking for those are the things we really want to look out for. And the problem that we still have, gender equals women, women equals vulnerable, um, and that does not address what kind of women, what elite women, women in power, women with power and influence, women with plenty of resources. Yeah, but what about all the other women? Uh, women, uh, intersecting with race and ethnicity, with, with disability, with any number of other uh, social axes of difference. So thinking about really unpacking gender term and then unpacking the women term even. Um, an interesting initiative, um, keep an eye on the time here. Uh, interesting initiative, Bangladesh National Resilience Program, um, and and they're they're trying to make this much more gender responsive. Their their goal to sustain the resilience of human and economic development in Bangladesh through inclusive, gender responsive disaster management and risk informed development. Um, that's happening now. And one of the kind of side projects that I was a bit involved with is the development of a gender marker for LGED. LGED is Local Government Engineering Department. 
So we're back to construction, reconstruction. Uh, what does that have to do with gender? Well, you know, we we we're trying to find ways to strengthen gender awareness and uh, the gender work. Um, but local government engineering department in Bangladesh, they already have a gender equity strategy. They already have an action plan and a gender forum, which is extremely unusual for uh, an engineering department. Um, and so the gender marker is a way for the engineers um, before a project, during a project, after a project, to kind of mark it for its, its uh, inclusion of gender considerations. There's a whole load of examples that are provided for them to look out for. So again, back to gender again, and deconstructing gender. Um, so gender is never just about gender. As I said, it, it's more intersectional and cross cut with so many things. Uh, and disasters are never just about disasters. And um, a problem in disasters is that, is that we focus on the exceptional, the big event, the major event. What about all those little ones happen every year or every six months or frequently? What about the everyday, the underlying um, development concerns? So um, a lot of the talks focus on women, but we want to open up this definition of women. So as we've begun that process uh, in disasters, you know, we started from gender equals women. Um, thank you, Lego. And we've, we've, we've started to develop ideas around diversity. So you can see in, in this one, in this image, there's one of these and one of these and one of these, you know, it's this quota system or tick box system. Let's have a committee, let's have one of these and one of these and one of these. But what we really want to get to is this kind of intersection, intersectionality approach, where we recognize the difference within the, the categories, across the categories, and sometimes the multiplication of impacts that, that can cause. Um, and not too much gender theory, and I'll zip over it a little bit because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not got too much time here. But um, the, the, this problem of heteronormativity, um, the, the problem of assuming the nuclear family, assuming the man, the woman, and they have a boy and a girl, and that's a perfect family. And uh, and it, it's the world isn't like that. Um, but the role of disaster narratives are to do with this reinstatement and reinforcing of the status quo and um, recreating what are already pre-existing patriarchal or heteronormative and a lot of other social structures. Um, and um, Gayatri Spivak has, um, has, has described uh, this kind of heteronormativity as the broadest global institution. So the, this is where we're, we're needing to, to try and advocate and make change. Because if we can make change at that level, then um, I almost said, <laughs> I almost said trickle down then, but I'm not going to use that phrase. Um, but it, it's going to ripple out uh, into the fields of disasters and humanitarianism. Um, so there's a whole lot of silenced voices out there. Um, and uh, in another group, um, again, the work that we do tends to be working with other people and coalitions and we all take a slightly different route through this, but together, you know, we can hopefully make a difference. So uh, Edge Effect um, is a really great group um, based in Australia. Um, have a look at them. There's a link to their website there. Uh, and they're trying to develop these genuine partnerships with um, sexual and gender minorities. Uh, 
um, as I said, gender is never just about gender or just about women and girls. A lot of people would disagree with that, and I'm not going to get into or open up the box of, of gender critical theory and gender critical views, but nevertheless, it is another position that's out there um, that we need to be considering. Um, but, so the context and sensitivity to other ideas are absolutely key concerns, but shouldn't be silencing us from support and action through these kinds of coalitions. So back to the everyday, humanitarian context in the everyday. Um, we found, you know, that in conflict and uh, post-conflict settings, everyday needs are just not being met. And there's, there's this horrible mix of, of conflict, disasters, climate change, and, and the way they limit particularly women and girls um, uh, and gender minorities and their access, for example, to health care. Um, sexual and reproductive health um, service provision uh, is really underserved in disasters uh, and certainly in conflict situations. Education, access and provision constrained. Um, my colleague back at the center, Virginie Lamassel and I um, did a um, short project for Plan International on uh, Burkina Faso and Mali, um, where uh, there were a whole series of interviews with, with girls, but um, adolescent girls, but also their families, the communities, the, the, the people with power to make a difference. Um, that's uh, a link to that online if you were interested. Because the girls themselves, when you talk to the girls, and we're talking usually about subsistence level populations, they, they have big aspirations for themselves. They want to be doctors and lawyers, and but the people around them uh, have much more limited aspirations. So why are there such low aspirations for women and girls um, and for other marginalized groups? You know, our expectations of them and our opportunities provided to them are, are severely limited. Um, it's been estimated um, by, by uh, McKinsey, for example, the McKinsey Global Institute, um, and don't get bogged down in the numbers, but you know, they've said $12 trillion difference to global economy if we equalize that sort of gender in the, work, in the workforce. Um, but it, whatever it is, it's a big number, uh, the kind of difference we could make. Um, again, gender not just about women and girls. Um, having a look at um, Travis Alabanza's TED talk, he's, he's not, he um, is not talking from um, a, um, a disaster or humanitarian perspective. Um, she is speaking um, from a trans person's um, danger from every day going outside. Um, they, in this uh, quite short piece, it's about 15 minute TED talk, uh, is, is really good, I think. And the, the poetry and the language also. When I say trans, I also mean escape. I mean choice. I mean autonomy. I mean, wanting something greater than what you told me, wanting more possibilities than the one you forced on me. Uh, and that may, in this case, be you know, the label, the sex label you provided at birth. But then all the way through, the opportunities. The GRIT project, I have to mention the GRIT project because it's, it's such a big part of our lives in the center. It's such a big project. It's such a great project. Um, we want to make these changes, changes in narratives, in structures, in skills. And there's plenty of examples you could look at. Um, and I don't have time to talk about them now. Um, but there's you know, a great example of the work that um, two of my colleagues, Lu Louisa Achari and um, uh, Nadia Jackson did working with um, uh, traditional midwives in the Amazon. 
um, and teaching them how to use Excel spreadsheets um, so they can apply for grants, which in fact they then did and got some more money. Uh, a bunch of things that you can look at if you look at the GRIP website. Join the dots. Um, yeah, by the way, don't forget the men. Um, we're talking about masculinities and femininities. Uh, we're not just setting up this, you know, this argumentation between men and women. Um, but where, you know, where does this really hit us? It, it hits us in standing in line for disaster relief, of which will matter, you know, what gender you are and what gender you are if you're providing that relief, those relief goods. Um, transgender people in COVID in certain Latin American countries have to, to do their shopping on different days, men on one day, women on another day. Trans people, and they suffered a lot of abuse uh, at that time. Who gets to advocate for the, the, their needs and their rights? Um, and there's an example. Um, uh, and uh, yet another example, um, creating space for lots of voices without limiting their mandate and the importance of women's leadership. Basic needs, um, healthcare, sexual and reproductive health gets forgotten. Um, education, girls are often the first to be pulled out of education in a crisis. Um, An education may not be available to girls anyway. Livelihoods, work opportunities are often scarce um, uh, in humanitarian settings. The policy around refugees, IDPs, uh, other migrant groups doesn't support um, uh, very much in the way of decent livelihood opportunities. Fine. Fine. Um, I often get asked this, okay, you said all those things, can you suggest a book? <laughs> and I thought, well, I looked across my bookshelves and I just, I pulled a bunch off the shelves. Uh, and it's such a diverse area. And so you, you just need to dive in where you're most comfortable or impassioned or inspired to dive in where you think there is a need, you know, where you think there's something that you could support. Um, there's a lot more resources out there. So I introduce you to Gender and Disaster Network and GRIP project again, where we've started this, um, these, we call them reference guides. They're like annotated bibliographies. Um, and it, it, it's a growing resource, we hope. Um, so there's three of them for now. Um, there's, more planned. So uh, there's plenty of resources out there and you can search them online as well, put in keywords and see what pops up. Um, and particularly useful if you're gonna write an essay, <laughs> um, need a bunch of resources. Um, and there's a bunch of other references of people I've used or referenced in the past or might have stolen things from in this talk. And Thank you for listening. And um, please, yeah, comments, questions, observations, follow up. And if you've got a question for me that you want to follow up after, there's my email as well. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. I think I have a hundred questions, uh, but I'm just going to start with one question while you raise your hand so we can locate you and give you a mic. Uh, we're taking questions online and uh, in the room. So I think one of the burning questions I'm having while people think about their own question is, so as students, staff and humanitarian workers and future humanitarian workers, what can we do in practice to be a bit more gender responsive in an intersectional way? I think um, generally we're talking about developing cultural competence broadly. Um, 
and we could all do with a bit more of that in in the everyday anyway um but certainly in disaster situations because um you tend to get um, driven by something Sabra and I were talking about earlier, the tyranny of the urgent, where um, if you try and introduce gender, um, those who are responding in crisis situations will be saying, look, I'm here to save lives. You know, people are, are starving or injured or, and you, you want me to think about gender. But, you know, the example I mentioned earlier on, you know, standing in line to get relief goods. If you don't consider how you set up that line, that queue of people, then you're not saving all the lives that you could be saving. Because there will be groups and subgroups who won't be able to stand in that line. And if they do stand in the line, then they may not have enough um, bulk and power uh, and strength to push their way to the front to get the goods and indeed to carry them away with our goods. So having that cultural competence immediately says, well, maybe we ought to think about some separate lines or we ought, we ought to uh, think about who is giving out what um, in the line. I mean, there are horrible examples of, for example, um, humanitarians who've been told to give out non-food items and particularly to give out sanitary items to, uh, to women and menstruating um, girls. They don't go as far as thinking of menstruating people, um, but who, who treat it as a joke and a way of um, sexually <coughs> harassing what it is um the women and girls who who have to line up and ask men for sanitary towels for them. um think about those things yeah it's just it's it's once you kind of switch on to the sensitivity then you just have to think it through and and then question the actions that you're planning um and think about it in the plans, in the policies, so that it, you don't have to rely on everyone in the field having the cultural competence because you set it up in the policy and told them what, what to do or what not to do, or some examples of what they could do to try and limit that kind of violence. And it is, it's violence against particular social groups. Thank you for that. Do we have any? I'm really surprised we don't have questions on this one. <laughs> ah, we have questions online. Yeah, could we have a microphone? Today? Thank you. You don't have to ask questions either. You know, I welcome your ideas and opinions and yeah, challenges, arguments. Uh, so this is from Dana Kelly. Hi, I have an introductory uh, one day one, one day lecture for undergrad students on general What is the key point that I should not miss while I'm here? Also said, a colleague of mine working in higher education was she told me to say that while all kinds of work should be cross told it to be gender feminist topics, um, nobody is interested in it and it's not an attractive topic anymore, so the world. I was told that, I was told that um, in the 1990s when I first discovered, you know, the, the differential impacts of disasters, in this case floods in Scotland, on, on women and older people, particularly older women, um, and a colleague who will be nameless said, Gender, hmm. it's very 80s, isn't it? You sure you want to do that? Well, you know, since that day, I just literally haven't stopped. Um, mainstreaming, yeah. It, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with mainstreaming. It's what you have to do as well as. So mainstreaming tends to be 
we want we want gender cross cutting everything we do. And as I said earlier, it then becomes everywhere and nowhere. Who's responsible for that? So you really need this focal person who is going to uh, carry that through to, to be that person. And who is that person? Guess what gender they usually are, and the fact that usually they're the gender focal person, but not full-time, because it's not a full-time job, is it? No, this is what we do alongside their real job. So what's wrong with mainstreaming? All of those things. There's nothing wrong with mainstreaming and, and making it uh, visible, but you can't, uh, you can't get, let people get away with being bored with the subject when it's a fight that is not over. And um, if you, you know, grab hold of a few, um statistics and uh, show the way particularly women and girls only because we have more data on women and girls but emerging other groups as well and um, how they are um uh disenfranchised often um, and um differentially impacted in disasters so yeah nothing wrong with it necessarily depends what you do with it Um, I have a question. Oh, hi, got you. <laughs> hi, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned uh, negotiations like the pandemic, and we weren't going to do it chapter by chapter, line by line. And you just diplomatically mentioned that not all suggestions were accepted. <laughs> and I'm wondering if uh, if memory serves you, if you recall a specific example of something that was not included in the final text that you would really like to see in there. Thank you. I think the problem was, um, and it's partly you know, the same as the, the earlier question in a way, people, people didn't like us to keep on mentioning gender um, because it would just pop out at them all of the time. So we can't keep saying that, can we? You know, it, it's too often, but for every point, you can make a gender point, and therefore we were trying to do that. We are we're trying to make um, gender points across, you know, if it's warning systems or it's reconstruction or, or it's re recovery or whatever it might be. Um, there are gender points you can make. There are, there are gendered examples that you can make. Um, but it rubs people up the wrong way if they see it too often. And um, in a way, I'm kind of guilty of that myself now because uh, I recognize this, you know, mention gender, off it goes over the head, switch off. And the last thing you want is for people to switch off. But if you can open it up so that people can identify more find themselves in it somewhere as a as a man or a boy uh, a gay person a trans person a person with disability a person with uh, indigenous heritage uh, you open it up more you can still make gender uh, points but it becomes a lot more inclusive and a lot more possible for people to identify with the issues and in you have to be also sensitive to the different contexts in which you make these kinds of challenges. Um, and uh, in, in some contexts, the, the, the first priority is going to be around race and ethnicity, cross with gender, cross with other factors. But that is going to be the primary concern. So you, you need to be sensitive to that situation. So when we were a bunch of us taken off to uh, Geneva to go through the Hyogo framework for action, so the follow-up implementation of the Hyogo framework, the forerunner to the Sendai framework, you know, that was the chapter by chapter. Um, and nobody wants to hear about rights. They like needs. They like to know about women's needs and women's vulnerability. Uh, they're not so concerned with the rights and the equities issue. 
Uh, they also you know, don't want to hear it all the time, line by line. Um, and they don't want to go beyond that uh, boundary. And they don't want to get into um, the, the, the sometimes too abstract for policymakers' world of gender theory. Uh, um, and, and nowadays, um, to even mention queer theory is a huge problem in uh, certain kind of constituencies. So yeah, not to remember a precise example, but you know the general feeling is okay, gender, but just not too much of it. Yeah. I can shout. <laughs> <laughs> no, I forgot to read the Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for those online. Um, if you didn't get the question, um, then you you just got the answer. We'll try and remember to tell you the question as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just show the Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and for those of you who are online, it, it's um, how do you really um, speak to the, the the dominant groups who tend to be um, cis male uh, and who who are rather objectify or or other um, any uh, other gender groups, etc. I think for most of most of the times I've made felt like I've made a connection there. It's been through the specifics and the concrete examples where you try and present the issue, whichever aspect you're trying to um, relate, in a very concrete way um, of a person. I mean, if you look at the Travis Alabanza. Uh, video, the TED talk, for example. Um, there's a, you know, a really excellent um, example, excellent in a horrible way, example of everyday abuse. Um, walking across Waterloo Bridge and, and someone abusing them and throwing a burger at them, you know, uh, and. And everybody just standing around or, or walking by and not acknowledging, trying to make people feel. Um, if you have a look at the, the Kimberly Crenshaw TED talk from a long time ago, any, any of Kimberly Crenshaw's work around intersectionality, where well, she's really focusing around gender and race primarily, but um, the same ideas are useful. But it's so moving. I mean, I you know, I defy you to be to 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 go through that TED talk unmoved. Um, so it's it's making that emotional connection in, that's important. Uh, I, I spent a long time doing um, doing work, um, and, and you you talk about it as an academic before you talk about it in this somewhat abstract way. Um, but when people can hear about it or read about it and see real people jumping off the page or, 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 or coming from your mouth as, you know, real people with, with, with lives very much like theirs, if they have the opportunity, um, you can try and make that connection because otherwise you're faced with a you know, sociological um, process of Othering, you know, this is me and this is us, and then there are the others that we have to deal with in some way. Um, it's trying to make the others us, <coughs> and 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 
uh, bring in the humanity. That's that's my argument. But there's no, yeah, I, you know, I'd love to be able to say, just you know, just do this. It's so contextual, I think. But find the concrete example of of a of a person in pain um, because of some policy, some practice, some action, uh, and make it real to the people you're trying to convince. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I agree with the panel about confidence to do. Uh, I wanted to know uh, if your your perspective is probably something that you can do. I think it's a similar um, understanding of what is meant by public and what is meant by public and what is meant by public. The area is one of the topics in the past. I mentioned the role of the other in general. Uh, I think there's been a lot of talk about it, and maybe not in a little, um, but there is not been a translate into action or change in the policy. Um, but yeah, I was curious to know how you will translate and put the story into the policy of America. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So the question is about the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And we're now um, uh, going through the midterm review. Uh, in fact, um, I'm being uh, interviewed on Friday. Is it this Friday? Yes, yeah, this Friday. Um, it, about precisely that by UNDRR. Um, um, in other talks, uh, uh, I, I, I started it by, by saying, you know, well, if you wanted to get there, you know, I wouldn't have started from here. And that's the problem with those big global frameworks. If you start from there, the big global frameworks, uh, you're often working at this lowest common denominator that's going to get passed by enough member states. Um, you're also faced with the problem that this is all voluntary. Yes, um, member states will send their ministers and they do have to stand up um, and defend and project what, they're, what they've been doing in terms of all of those targets and, and priority actions. But no one's checking that. You know, who's doing the fact checking afterwards uh, of, of what's being said? Um, all voluntary. Um, having said that, you also have to bear in mind that a lot of what we're talking about ha carries costs with it, uh, even at the level of collecting disaggregated data. The more you disaggregate data, um, the bigger your study, your survey or whatever study it needs to be, uh, if you want to make some kind of um, statistically uh, appropriate generalization. That costs money. Uh, it costs money wherever you are, but if you are in um, one of the um, uh, uh, least economically, um, uh, rich areas of the world, it may be a price you can't pay. You might be politically committed, sorry, you might be politically committed, but you don't have the resource behind you necessarily to do some of the things. So I think, um, I always think you've got to contextualize <clears throat> to the particular um, uh, environments in which you're 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 working or you're hoping to advocate um, to see what is possible um, in those areas because a lot of the things we're talking about don't really cost money. Uh, changing your your ideas, changing your views, changing social norms don't necessarily cost money. Um, sort of, 
Yeah, we can all see ways in which it, you know you need to put money and resources into doing just that. But, um, so yeah, if you wanted to get to where we, the kind of space we've been talking about this evening, it's difficult to get there when you start from the Sendai framework as currently written. And uh, in terms of the UN system, um, there is a lot more now, it's been recognized, the need for, um, for different parts of the, of the UN system to work together. But nevertheless, you know, the different bits of it do have their own mandates. And um, there's some, you know, people are not always happy if, 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 if one part steps on another part's toes. Um, so you have to think about what is possible in the different contexts. But for sure, we could put more pressure um, in, in um, making it clear to member states and the ministers with responsibility in this area that if they don't do some of what we are suggesting is good policy and good practice, um, like collecting disaggregated data, they don't know how disasters are affecting their citizens. They just don't know. They know, they might know a number, an aggregated number, but that's not enough if you want really to put um, uh, into practice concrete policies, because you have to know, well, who is really um, seriously in harm's way here? Who is um, being significantly in, over impacted? Um, and shouldn't we start there? So uh, you can make that kind of informed choice if you have the data. If you don't, you're just guessing. So some more, definitely more follow up because there's very um, limited responses in terms of collecting, actually collecting disaggregated data and signing up to, to do that across the member states. So there's, there's a lot more that could be done. Is there, we still have time for one or two questions, depending on the question. Ah, okay. Yeah, we'll go for you and then for the online one. And then. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask a question about the cultural aspects of the Chinese Of course, if we want to look at some context, then we go to South. So there is a cultural elements where for men, not yet in women, to get involved in the responsibilities of disaster is a more of cultural duty for them because they need to protect women. You know, so we have for them uh, to let the women be in the bar. It's not the bar about um, uh, being defined there, but to consider that as a more duty. <laughs> support of everything I can see it's for for some contestants but I'm taking my own research because um in this case we say but um humanitarian interventions in uh strongest way such as parts has been used as we control and so in such in this context for example checks comes back um called so, because women are targeted by the media and the men do for so men feel like they don't have to force them. So, all the hands from women to get fully involved. So, it makes them to get raised. So, what I'm so how can we address these? Um, Issues around Thank you for that really uh, important question. So it's very much about the, the the cultural context for all of the things we've been talking about, um, and the 
cultural sensitivity to um, what are well, you you raised so many um, really good examples. I'm not sure if people online could could hear them, which is a shame because they were all very good and worth listening to. Um, I, I I couldn't agree more with the problematic um, problematic that you present there. Um, and and who am I to to go to some other country and say you should be doing this? Um, we can give some examples for sure, but often you get the change through uh, the the trusted voices in the locality, and so uh, you know it kind of research methods, sociological terms, you, you go through the gatekeepers, you know, you you try and find uh, allies and sympathetic voices who who get it uh, and can uh, can speak to their community neighbors and friends, their family, their colleagues. Um, but but for sure it it's dangerous, you know, some of the things that we might be suggesting from this very white Western liberal position um, spell extreme danger. And so it's not something where you can just click a switch and make it happen overnight uh, because you, you potentially get enormous backlash, very serious, dangerous backlash. So I, I come back to the cultural competence, the, the contextual analysis, the allies and coalitions, and finding ways to, to make the case. I mean, I, I hope you, know, you might have gotten an idea from the uh, uh, Mazura Parvin's uh, video, um, where she was coming from, where people were saying, no, you know, you you just go into the, the, the household compounds and, uh, and look after the women and the children. Like, you're a woman, that's your job. And she's saying, no, no I, can, I can do this. Uh, you can do it, so I can do it. And she's made such a difference. Um, and she's pushed against things, but she's shown uh, that she's brought women along with her uh, and she's improved their security and their situation. So she's got some concrete results from transgressing, transgressing the, the social and the cultural norms. But she couldn't do it alone, you know, so, you know, there are others around her who are enabling her to that extent. So who are the enablers or the disablers in those contexts? You know, who who are the people who can make things happen because people listen to their voices? And they may not go as far as you would like them to go, but they might just go some way and it might just be you know, the, the, the first ripple on, on the lake. Uh, but it, yeah, it's, it's a crucially important um, series of points that you raised there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll just in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get the last two questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, okay, so the last two questions in line are what the first one is um, anonymous and it says, what can you bring one of the sexual analysis that women experience in the world that marginalize them in the And And the, there was a second one? And the second one is the woman Shikara and Shikara. Can you please share some thoughts for example, I'm not seeing the development of the disasters theory or equally the way the disasters make the very helpful to other. In one minute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there's, no quick, there's no quick answer to the first question, which was around, you know, which is the, the most common intersection. But I mean, you've only got to look at the challenges to white Western liberal feminism from the 1960s onwards that came from women of color, um, black women, 
um, particularly in the United States, but you know that ripple much further. Uh, subaltern studies, um, yeah. So I, I think there's a massive intersection across uh, across uh, gender and race. I think there's a growing one around gender and age, and I can say that now as I advance through the years. Um, older women, for example, are invisible in the world. Um, and then the, uh, the second one which was on men and masculinities. Um, there's so much we don't know about men and masculinities. We only know as much as we do in terms of the gender um, material that we have, because women have been that focus. So we're now opening up those uh, gender and other categories. Uh, what we never hear about, uh, and yes, it, it's Probably, I say probably again, problem of no disaggregated data, uh, problems of reporting. It's probably a smaller number than as affects women, but uh, male rape, uh, and particularly in times of war and conflict, nobody wants to talk about that. Um, masculinities socialization of males into these you know macho risk takers um, where they will put themselves in danger because it's what men do and what men are expected to do uh, the, the the gendered roles of who is the rescuer and who is the rescued uh, who does what in a disaster it's so socially coded uh, we've really got to, to start looking at all of those things. There's excellent work from Australia, Deborah Parkinson, Claire Zara's work, particularly around um, men and masculinities in, in uh, bushfires in Australia. Uh, I recommend you having a look at that work. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, everyone. I think we have a reception there. So now we can mingle and socialize if you want to have a bit more question. And uh, thank you very much. See you next month. <laughs>